Hey, hey, hey. Hi, hi, hi. How you doing? Hi, Christine, Christine, Christine. Hey, why do you drink this week? <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh too hard. My lungs are not uh, the way they used to be. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I drink this week because, folks, Canada did me dirty. Man. The big C gave me the big C, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> And, uh, man, I have not been feeling right. <laughs> I did. Yeah. I've not been feeling right. I don't yeah. know how, how they let me back in the country, but they sure did. So that's your it, fault, Canada. I am convinced that they saw you and a tickle in your throat and said, get out of our country. You know, it's so why, uh, first of all, this is my, any, you, me, and Eva somehow have been those smug bastards who have evaded COVID this oh, entire time. Oh, and we time. were smug and I felt so good about it. I feel like such a dick now because I like, I like to myself, I like, I really thought I was going to like get out of this pandemic scot-free. I don't know what we, was wrong with me. Same. We were those, that meme of like in the matrix, like avoiding all the, you know, <laughs> that's, how and, I and felt. that's how all three of us and the fact that none of us got it, we were so impressed and like we had a couple exposures. So we were, you know, we were, mm -hmm. but we avoided it. And then I got off the phone with Em and I was like, wow, man, M's down. I still haven't had it. And then I got a text from uh, the beautiful Kenyan over at Wine and Crime who happened to be visiting town <laughs> the other day and spent the evening um, at our place, like just hanging out, playing games, like whatever. And she's like, I know this is the last thing you want to hear, but I just got a positive COVID test like two days after leaving my house. And I was like, I flew too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. with this smugness and I'm I'm feeling okay for now but um have you I tested yourself at all I have and it was negative but like I know it takes a few days to like show up positive usually so I'm mm -hmm. I'm waiting so well you know what I think it's very poetic that you and I would potentially have to deal with this at the same time like fr and not even from each other you know like You're we right. got it <laughs> separately but like still but so anyway as of right now I mean Leona seems okay uh, I'm mostly afraid of for her but like I got vaccinated while I was pregnant so they say that the antibodies you know yeah anyway but I'm I'm glad you're you're sounding a lot better I will say thank you I um man I really was loving the I I think I just thought like oh I've skipped it this far like it was definitely not gonna happen and then I got to Canada and I was like this is my one time since the pandemic. I'm going to let myself get loosey goosey. And Man. that was, that was my downfall. So, Man. and I got to say, they, I don't know. I was confident that I didn't have it even when I was sick because I took three different tests and they all came back. Were they negative. all on the same day? No, they were all on different days. Two of them I had, I had to get, to get back into the country. Right. You probably hadn't like, but you didn't have symptoms yet. I, I know I, I had a really gnarly sore throat, but I had also, this is probably where I got it, my friends. I went to a drag bar mm. and uh, I did a lot of screaming the night before. So I equated my sore throat to just uh. like having a good time at the gay bar. But then that sore throat got super gnarly very quickly. And I remember thinking like, oh, well, maybe like. I accidentally set off a sore throat and now like I'm realizing the stress of traveling and the stress of tour and now I have to travel back into the country. So like maybe like I'm it's just exasperated on by my own stress. So I kept ignoring it. And then when I got here, I just had a head cold and I was like, oh, well. But anyway, so I I just I just thought it was just a cold and Allison ended up getting it and I'm a sweet, sweet, stinky witch. And she was like, just for fun, I'm going to take a test because like things have been going around and maybe it's all the vaccinated people finally catching COVID and not realizing that that's what it is. Yeah. So she took a test and it was positive and I went, that can't be. So I took a fourth test and it was finally positive. So, oh my God. <laughs> yikes. So anyway, that's luckily I, I got tested positive as I was on the mend. So there was no reason to scare myself, but I feel bad for you, Christine. I really hope you don't get it. I, I mean, listen, me too. And, uh, Ooh, I'm not going to enjoy that, especially with the baby. I hope she's okay. I'm mostly worried about Oof. her, but, um, is but your, yeah, I'm, your throat's okay currently? Yeah. But I was telling you before we recorded, I'm doing that thing where like, I start to think about a sore throat and then mm -hmm. I feel like I manifest one and I'm like, okay, I need to just get out of that headspace of like, 
turning my, my uh-huh. like phantom pains into something that they're not. Um, so I'm trying to just kind of avoid it, avoid thinking too much about it. Uh, but I mean, knock on wood so far, we're, we're okay. Um, poor Kenyon is sick, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know it takes, they say like five to seven days, I think to show up on a positive test. Mm. Uh, so that's probably why yours didn't show up right away. Uh, yeah. So folks, if you think you have a, a sore throat or if you think you're not feeling good and you're like, oh, I can still go to that party. It t- I tested mm-hmm. negative. It, it might still be, <laughs> it still might be the big also, C. Like, so it's 2022 now. If you have a sore throat and it's a head cold, still don't go to the party. Like don't give everyone else the head cold. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. I, I don't know who's who's feeling as loosey goosey as I was. I I really risked it all in Canada. I thought I was being seemingly safe. I I didn't. I don't know. I'm sure that's how everyone feels before they catch. I COVID, know. So it's whatever. like I, I did too, and I just had two people over, and then you know, whoopsies. There we there we go. So it doesn't even take take a, a drag show, unfortunately. But well, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I see you. I heard you're drinking a G Raid to get your electrolytes up. I got my G raid. Well, this was Good. Allison's G raid and she is not drinking it. I, the second I realized I had a cold and we had no cold medicine, I was like, okay, I know Allison's going to get sick. So I'm going to go and like splurge and get her everything from CVS. And by go, I mean, have it delivered to us. <laughs> and, uh, she is not appreciating the, uh, the basket of goodies I've sent her away, including this G raid. So I took it from the fridge and I, I wonder if it's cause you also brought her another gift from Canada called <laughs> The big C. <laughs> I was telling Christina, I was like, I guess I have smuggled something into the country. <laughs> and so. a virus, no less. Like, that's impressive, Em. <laughs> Good impressive. job. I didn't even know I was doing it. Anyway, yeah. uh, do you have a reason why you drink outside of this? Um, well, I, I did. I'm trying to remember what it was. I mean, one of the main ones that uh, that I feel like I've been complaining about to you off, off air is that my mom um, and sister and stepdad are in Germany for six weeks Right. And I think we're like two weeks in and I feel like they've been gone for eight years. And I like my mom (laughs) usually comes over every Monday and Wednesday to help with the baby for like from like 10 to 2 just so I can either record with you or record rituals or whatever or even just with Zandy. (laughs) Yeah. Or with Zandy or take a shower. And um, she's out of town and I'm like drowning. And so I had my poor brother is now has now stepped in and he is downstairs. He's with Leona now. They're actually on a walk outside. Um, and he's gotten really good at like putting her down for naps and all that fun stuff. So, um, I I just, I'm just, uh, I don't know. I feel very lucky that my mother's around to help me two days a week, but when she's gone, I'm not too thrilled with her choice to leave the country. But I have a feeling Leona's having a goddamn blast because last I checked, Funkle Zandy is like the man with the plan. Like, honestly, I don't know. I, I got, I tried and maybe it's the distance. I'm not too sure, but I do feel threatened. And honestly, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I get it. He's blood, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? You know what, Leona? They both have those big heads though. Those big head circumference. And those big baleful eyes. I think they just, they just look at each other and see each other. And they're like, I see you, you see me. You get it. I get it. Um, Anyway, I, yeah, she, Uncle Sandy is like the number one these days, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's the number one, much to my chagrin. Um, and you know who I'm even more threatened by? Leona's number two. Allison Goforth. I was wondering if you were going to say that. Yeah. Allison showed up and Leona was like, well, this is someone I would like to be friends with. And I was like, good, good choice. And then Allison's like, I'm texting M right now. And I was like, uh oh. <laughs> Allison also has big baleful eyes. Yes, so. she does. Yes, she I, does. Uh, and a big head, apparently. And she's got a big ass head, Miss <laughs> Allison. <laughs> I, I love her and her big old head, but it it never shrank uh, at any point. It just keeps going and going. She's got a big fat brain in there. I know. But you told me, I didn't know this at first, that uh, Leona and Allison play chase together. They're. Mm. Uh, Apparently, Leona was laughing at everything Allison everything. did. Everything. Everything. Allison would just l- glance at her and she'd start laughing. But I think Allison also has a very infectious laugh, as you know. She and does. So she she so really sweet. does. And so Allison would start laughing and then Leona would start laughing more. And it like became this kind of cycle. And then, of course, I'm laughing. So I'm like, what the hell is going on? Um, but yeah, I taught, uh, well, Leona taught Allison her favorite game, which is chase, which basically means you hold leona over your shoulder and someone follows you whether it's a dog or a cat or a person and she thinks she's being chased and i think she likes like the thrill of it and she starts like freaking out and laughing and like 
jumping up and down. It's her favorite thing to do. So Alice, she and Allison play chase. Must and be nice, man, Allison. They had so much fun. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so happy for them. You know, but, one day. What? I have one day, May 30th and 31st. You're coming mm-hmm. to Cincinnati, whether you like it or not, because guess what, folks? We're doing book signings. Oh, my gosh. Hey, what a segue. Yeah. I know. And, I, and I just you, remembered. <laughs> and I feel like the way you're going to end that sentence is I'll have a redemption period with yes. Leona away from Allison and Uncle Zandy. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm just going to call it the geo situation where she'll love me in about three years. And then we're going to be best friends. And more than anyone, you know, and more than more anyone. Than anyone. Um, but yes, we do have a book signing coming up. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we're signing books, basically, because our books come out May 31st. Uh, We're so excited. If you haven't gotten a copy, it would mean so much if you pre-ordered it, because I guess from what I've heard from other podcasters and authors, the pre-sale, like, has a lot of impact on, like, the lists that come out and how much exposure it gets. Um, It's called A Haunted Road Atlas. We're really proud of it. Uh, We're, like, super, super proud of it. And uh, we worked really hard on it. And it comes out May 31st. But if you pre-order it now, it'll get to you, I think, that day or, or it'll ship that day. Wow. That was um, exactly perfectly done. So I'm not even going to contribute. <laughs> well done, I, Christine. I have one final question before you start your story. Oh. How do you feel about traveling with me on, like, without having a show? Like, is that going to be better for you? Oh, it's like, going to be less... so much fun. We're going to have a blast. Okay, good. I just want to make sure you weren't going to be as nervous about, like, the book signings as you I were mean, about. I mean, every moment I'm with you, I'm a nervous wreck. But I know, the butterflies just... It's the butterflies from my platonic crush I have on you. But on top of that, it's it's nervousness for what you're go- whatever ruckus you're going to start. Oh, right, because of my, my erratic behavior. I see. <laughs> <laughs> the nerves are all over the place because so were you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Uh, anyway, yeah. that's all. Okay, well, here's... By the way, I love when you say, I have a question for you, and I have no idea what direction oh, it's going in. Oh, so. all part of my erratic behavior, so... Yeah, well, hey, I dig it. Okay, so um, here's my story. It is, uh, hmm, I guess a haunting, also a mystery. Ooh! You tell me. This is uh, from Angus, Scotland, and this is the Glom's Castle. Ooh. Oh, speaking of Scotland, we met CK. Have we talked about that on the show? I just want to throw out there, like, shout no, out. Maybe we, we did. No, we have not. I, no, we have not. Oh we my haven't gosh. recorded since we saw him. Yeah, what am I thinking? I feel like I'm losing my mind. But we got to finally meet CK in person, which is just, like, A so delight. full circle. I mean, he started listening, like, episode three or something. Yeah, it's been a several year long wait <laughs> yeah so anyway shout out to ck go listen to mirths and monsters uh his voice is so soothing and wonderful velvety i'd say i would agree yeah i think that's a good way to put it just tuck you tuck yourself in and let ck talk to you for the rest the of time smooth sounds yeah yeah, yeah 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 anyway thank you ck for finally coming to one of our shows also he like lost all of his luggage on the way to us and everything oh my so, god yeah from he, fucking scotland or where does he live he lives in england but england um, oh my god he literally lost they lost his luggage i on the way there and he's like yeah it's basically all my clothes because i was here for gonna be here for so long i'm like that's <laughs> truly a nightmare so shout out <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't have, and that's why we drink, or personally visit, and that's why we drink without having a reason to drink. So. Oh my God, we should send him some merch. <laughs> we should send him some clothes. That's what I'm saying. Like, we <laughs> okay, should send yeah, him some, like, t shirts and be like, here, now you can wear this throughout the United States of America on your journey. Also, speaking of which, uh, a spring collection oh my God. of and That's Why We Drink just came out. So New merch. Sorry, this because... is like promo hour, but. I was about to say, oh, let's get him our merch and then also pants. And then I went, wait a minute. We now also offer pants. So. Dude, they're glow-in-the-dark joggers. What's that about? It's the greatest invention. Um, I kind of wish we put, and that's why we drink on the tushy, like a like a, like ooh, a like juicy. A good old, like pink, juicy Oh, pink. Situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, I w- yeah. We'll do that next time. Okay, we'll, it'll we'll, say, do- we'll say, drink it up. Drink. And then it'll be velour and it'll be so hot. <laughs> <laughs> you'll never see it coming CK it, except in the dark so good oh in, except in the dark yeah <laughs> but that's at uh atwwdmerch.com if you're interested and i think patreon gets a, a discount code too so kind of fun okay back to this castle mm-hmm. uh the glom's castle which i just checked is how you pronounce it because up until five seconds ago i was calling it the glamis castle Yikes. oh dear so uh how do you spell that glam I S. I S. Okay, got it. Uh, so Glom's Castle is in Angus, Scotland. It has 14,000 acres. Mm. 
uh, including the the castle and then parks, gardens, and farms. Whoa. Okay. Lovely. And it was, I guess it the property started getting used around 1016. Oh. <laughs> as a year. Um, at 1016 a.m. And <laughs> at 1034, uh, in 1034, <laughs> um, the land started being used as a Scottish royal hunting lodge. So that was when the property first started getting used by royalty. Okay. This is also the site where Malcolm II died. Fun fact. Mm. And uh, the foundation, here's my one of my favorite fun facts of the whole thing. When they were planning on building onto this property or when they planned on building a castle, the foundation was actually supposed to be on another piece of land. And that piece of land was a hill called Fiery Pans. What? <laughs> that was the name of the hill because I guess a bunch of ritual fires used to be lit on this hill. Whoa. And so they were going to go build on this hill, but... Every day the builders would come back and they would see that their work had been destroyed on this hill. And so they were like, what is going on? Like, what, how can we cannot, how can we can't build on here? And one day they go this on in the morning to try again and they hear a voice and this little voice says, build not on this enchanted spot where man hath neither part nor lot, but build down in yonder bog where it will neither shake nor shog. <laughs> okay, and Dr. It, Seuss. <laughs> and this whole time it was me and my troll hole. I was um, going to say, get out of my troll hole, go build in a bog somewhere. <laughs> um, and so they assumed that it was fairies uh, who wanted nothing to do with humans and so the builders decided to work uh, or build their castle or their property elsewhere. And they picked a different flatter space. And that Did is they pick where... a bog? Because that's where they were told to go. I don't know if it's a bog, but it has neither shook nor shogged. So uh, well, I, they're doing something need. right. Yeah. Uh, so that's the beginning of the creation of this uh, castle. So now in the, or at least the property, I don't know if the castle was fully built at the time. Mm-hmm. It was officially built in the 1370s, which somehow was 300 years yeah, later because it feels like it was a million years ago. Um, okay, so it was built for Sir John Lyon, who was the Thane of Gloms. <laughs> I don't know like what you're th- just making up words. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I, he- I was reading the word Thane, I kept thinking of your bullshit. You saying Thane. <laughs> everybody eva wasn't feeling well last week so i was like i'm gonna go like do kind of a little once over of the episode and the amount of times i kept saying (laughs) fneed and you were having really the worst day of your life and i i do apologize but i don't regret it so this this guy was the thane of gloms and you'd be the fneed of kentucky that's (laughs) <laughs> so the castle was built for sir john lyon and this was part of his dowry that he got for marrying the king's daughter sure Yikes. casual can you imagine like marrying someone's daughter and like that's not even the the best part you also get a castle they're like thank from you the so king. much for doing this honor for me here's a castle that you're taking my daughter or and now this beautiful beautiful haunted castle Thanks for taking this inconvenience off of my hands. Do it in a castle made by me on my dime. (laughs) On my bog. (laughs) So since then, the castle has remained the home of the Lyons family. And when I say since then, I mean literally since the 1370s. Oh, wow. 23 generations later, the family still owns it. Wow. So um, the castle's remained. It's now instead of the Lions family, they're now the Bows Lions family. They've hyphenated, which is so mm. progressive. <laughs> so um, progressive. They're apparently also known as the Earl of Strathmore. Earl okay. of, so the Earl of Strathmore and his family is said to live here. Although I did see one article say that since the 80s, they do technically own the property, but just live elsewhere, probably because a castle is a lot to upkeep. That's what I'm thinking. Um, so there were major renovations throughout the 15th and 17th centuries, but since the 18th century, not much has changed. So again, I can see why people since the eighties have not wanted to live there. Yeah. They're like, I, all I want is like one of those nest thermostats and it's just not going to work in this giant (laughs) castle. I just 
want plumbing. I don't know what is so <laughs> hard about that. want plumbing. Um, this actually was the childhood home of Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who married George VI and later became Queen Elizabeth. So, oh. or the Queen Mother is her other name. So, okay. Princess Margaret was also born in this castle. Mary, Queen of Scots, has visited this castle, and so has Sir Walter Scott. They have, hmm. He's also stayed here. Um, fun fact, this is the location Shakespeare used in Macbeth. Oh. Apparently, this is where Macbeth literally lived in Shakespeare. That is pretty wild. So imagine having a castle so notorious that literally Shakespeare is like, aha, my main character must live here. Love that setting. And I don't know enough about Shakespeare, but I feel like maybe he was like trying to appease the king or something. So maybe that's how. That's but a that, good point. The king, the king also didn't live here. Maybe he had something to deal with the, the Earl of Strathmore Who specifically. Who knows what kind of like little politics he was playing, what little strings he was pulling, you know, that, that I, Willie P. Shakes, whatever you call him. <laughs> I totally forgot that I called him that. What was it? Shakesy P or something. Shakesy P. Oh, that's from, that's from a musical. But yeah, I, it definitely... I definitely stole that from the musical. We were recording Shakes rituals and M just said Shakespeare P as if I'm supposed to know what the hell is going on. <laughs> oh well now, God. Hey, now you taught me what I taught you. We're all, it's a full circle. I now. think then I called him bill. Cause I was trying to play, like I was trying to like, play <laughs> along and I forgot. Why do you, you remember every fucking conversation we've ever had? You are a, the craziest person. In the you entire never world. know when you'll need it. <laughs> That's so ominous. I'm sorry. <laughs> But it's and true. that's why I get nervous whenever I travel <laughs> with you. I mean, I don't blame you and I never second guessed you for one minute. Like, you're right to be scared. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. And that's how you kill me. Oh, no. <laughs> R.I.P. Another fun fact is that this uh, building did not have electricity until 1929. So the royals were just like living in literally the dark ages oh, so no. oh no uh and by dark ages i mean because it was dark okay so yeah yeah i get it <laughs> okay before someone's like that wasn't the dark ages i just like i know 1929 was not the dark ages it was also Thank the you. ice ages because there wasn't heat okay I, you know what this is why i allow you to scare I me every moment get okay it. <laughs> Uh, so the castle is now open to the public, even though people are said to possibly live there. I think it's just the first 10 front rooms you can tour, mm. which I think is still like probably for all I know, like 12,000 square feet. So right. I think you're fine. Um, and you can also book a virtual tour if you don't want to go there oh, that's uh, fun. physically, which is so fun. I don't know if that's a COVID situation or if they were ahead of their time, but mm -hmm. love a good virtual tour. Mm -hmm. um also i went to a castle when i was in canada and i would have certainly loved a virtual tour because that was a lot of walking i did and there Is was a you, lot when, of stairs yeah i was gonna say i saw that you went up all those stairs and you the secondhand anxiety i got watching that after seeing you on like a set of four stairs the night before uh-huh what uh -huh. are you doing i gotta tell you those stairs were rough this that was especially because I don't I can't do stairs anymore with my heart problem. So um, I I think I thought it was one flight and I was like, OK, I'm committed. And then once I got up there, there were like people were like, there's two more flights. And I went, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, and you're stuck. And that was a, on one tower. There were two towers I had to do that on. I was like, motherfucker. Mm. I was really oh, thought I was no. going to have to be upside down on the roof of a castle, which like, wow, you know, I, wasn't, I wasn't really complaining about Um so here's the eerie thing about the Glom's castle. Uh, there is a well-known hidden family secret, supposedly so terrible that it what? might drive you mad. What? And here's the point where I have to disappoint you because oh. I'm not at any point during this going to tell you what the secret is. Because you don't know it. Because I don't know it. No one knows. It's... Well, that's almost even better, though, because then it's like the mystery remains. Uh -huh. Well, OK. I didn't know if you thought I was going to have something to break to you, but I, ha I don't know what the secret is. But to this day, nobody knows the secret except only three people at a time. Uh, huh? So the only people who ever know the secret are the Earl himself, the manager of his estate, and the next male gross heir to the throne on his 21st birthday what a party they have to tell him before he takes shot a bunch of shots because i feel like what if you forget <laughs> there's they're like here's a real reason to get fucked up well, <laughs> although also i guess over there they can drink before 21 that's i was American. gonna say yeah i don't know why 21 is the age then yeah um but so one earl uh his name was claude bose lion 
This is a quote from him about the secret. If you could even guess the nature of the castle secret, you would get down on your knees and thank God it was not yours. What? Em, what is it? I don't know. So here, I there's... would be there's so a, bad. I would tell everyone. You would be like, we have a secret. but I, I would tell... I, exactly. <laughs> and then I'd be like, I'd be like, I shouldn't tell you. And they'd be like, okay. And I'd be like, but I guess I can if you, if you insist. <laughs> and they'd be like, no, no, I respect your decision. And you'd be like, no twist my yeah, arm why don't you be like you need to come over here right now so i can whisper the secret in your ear otherwise you i'll probably fucking yell enjoy it, it and everyone's gonna hear it <laughs> and if i yell it that i can't tell everyone individually for the next three hours <laughs> that's right it's no fun yeah um and then you just tell everyone pretend you don't know and then just watch the game unfold <laughs> so here's the main theory as to what the secret of this castle oh, is yes i'm ready for this uh, all theories seem to float around the idea that there is a secret room in this castle and they don't know what the room is for. One mm. rumor is that this room is used for occult rituals. Um, by the way, go follow us and listen to us on rituals exclusively on Spotify. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, another is that this room was used to slaughter the enemies of the family. Excellent. Cool. Great. Here's a personal favorite rumor. Uh, that this room was used to hold uh, a child because every generation, the Lions family allegedly gives birth to one vampire who is then walled up and held inside this castle for the rest of time. Wait, <laughs> hang on. Okay, so for the rest of time. So are there like multiple vampiric children in this room? I don't know if they're all just like hanging out. With you. I if guess not immortal? because they don't have... If they're, but also like the only way they're surviving is by drinking other people's blood and they're being walled up to protect people oh, from getting yeah, their blood drank. So true. it'd be a bunch of like dead vampires. What the fuck? So that's one theory that there's every generation that gives a vampire child and you just lock them in there until sure. the next one's born. Okay. Wait. Uh, okay. First of all, I, I don't know I, vampire rules. Okay. I know, I but this, I know this is a theory, but like whose theory and why? Like what? maybe like like, someone who really hates vampires i'm like i can make a theory too but like i don't have any reason behind it yeah i don't know like why they picked a vampire maybe at the time that this series started showing up vampires was a big thing like kind of like twilight i don't know so whatever the official secret is uh all we know is that three people at a time will ever know what the secret itself is, but some of the Earls of Strathmore have allegedly just like flat out refused to even hear what the secret is because they didn't think they could take it. Whoa. Because they saw the Earls before them either losing their mind (gasps) or make it seem so dark. And they were like, you don't want to know what this is that Uh, people just, what is it? Didn't even want to know. In fact, uh, one estate manager who knew the secret, he refused to ever go back inside the castle after finding out. No. Another estate manager got snowed into the castle and was so desperate to not have to stay the night inside the castle that he made servants dig a mile long path back to his house so he could get home. Holy shit. So something's going on there. Also going on. uh, Elizabeth II, uh, who Queen Elizabeth currently, right? That's Elizabeth II. I believe so. Yes. Okay. So her aunt named Rose was she also i guess had stayed at the castle for a while and she was asked if she knew anything about the secret and apparently she got really serious and she was quoted saying we were never allowed to talk about it when we were our children our parents forbade us to ever discuss the matter or ask any questions about it my father and grandfather refused absolutely to discuss it oh my god is there uh, a serial killer in there? Like, nobody wants to stay the night? Like, I cannot understand. I know. Like, it's one thing to also... Like, I wonder if I wonder if that estate manager who was, like, afraid to even stay the night... I wonder if he was told, like, we kill our estate managers. Like, right? <laughs> like, That's like, what I'm what? thinking. Like, was he afraid? Of, he must have been afraid for his life. Otherwise, why would you not want to stay the night? Uh, documents of the original building do suggest that there is a space for a secret chamber near the charter room. But over uh, over time, I mean, literally since the 1300s, rumors mm. have convinced people and also just time has convinced people that there could be multiple secret rooms as far as we know at this point. Okay. So even though original, I don't know if it's blueprints, but a state property 
documents say like, oh, there was space at one point. I'm sure now with all those renovations since the 15th and 17th centuries, there could be a million secret rooms, which could right. be in itself the secret. So um, in 1904, the New York Sun actually reported about this and said that there was a doctor who was staying at the castle and discovered a trap door while inside. I was just thinking maybe it's a, some sort of trap door and you're worried about like falling down the trap door anyway. So I think that I think the way that the article went was that he f- found like a carpet that was lifted up in a right, weird way. So okay. he pulled it back and found a trap door. He wasn't like falling through it. <laughs> no, it like he, he discovered it. Okay. No, he apparently found it, went in there and then came out. And so the article says uh, when the guy found the trap door, quote, This passage ended in a cement wall, and the cement was still soft, leaving the impress of a finger. He returned to his room, and the next morning he received a check for his services, and a carriage was ready to take him to the station for the first train. So basically, he got paid to keep quiet and fucking leave. (gasps) And there was wet cement down there? Yeah, as if something had just been closed off, like a wall had just been (gasps) taken up. And then they gave him a check and they were like, get on the first train out of here. And then he was like, I'm going to write about this immediately. The New York Sun will hear about this. Yeah, I feel like he kind of, whatever. Okay. So there's a similar story of another workman who allegedly knocked through a wall during renovations and he found a secret room. And he also got paid to keep quiet and he was sent out of the country. Whoa, okay. Which feels like a mobster kind of way to just say, like, they killed him or, like, put him yeah, in the secret room. Yeah, he was sent room. to a farm, you know? It's like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. He was uh, removed from the situation. So he just... But we don't know what was in the secret room that he found. Nope. That's, hmm. that's, I think that one sounds more like... Because that one didn't come with an article about it. So I think that's a rumor of, like, oh, one time a construction worker found one and we just never heard from him again. Right, okay. So with enough suspicion, there have been guests... Most sources said it was guests, but one source actually said it was one of the ladies of the house. And because only male heirs get to find out what the secret is, the lady was also curious. And so yeah, her no and shit. all of, so her and all of her friends, this is one source, her and all of her friends. Another one is it was guests. Um, they when the Earl was out for the day. This is they, us. Like yes. immediately the second our parents leave the house or whatever, we're like, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll play our parlor and games. Are gone. We'll play our <laughs> parlor games in the parlor and then like immediately start ripping up all the carpets. This is kind of a parlor game. It's a re- deductive reasoning, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's great fun. Process of elimination. They decided that they were going to take towels and go to every single window that they could open a door. Like if they could get into a room, they were going to throw a towel uh, onto the other side of the window and like hang it on the window. So that way later when they went outside, they could <gasps> look so at all the windows. Smart. So when they would look outside and they could see all the windows, if there were any windows so that didn't have towels smart. hanging out of them, they could see if there was a secret room. And that is so smart. That's why we're going to do it one day. This is not you and me. This is you and me and like a third party, like Eva, who's like, you know what this is? Idea. This is fucking big headed allison and leona at harvard oh boy i knew they to invite themselves somehow i knew it too and uncle they, zandy probably he's all into his escape rooms they would figure it out forget it the three of them are oddly smart and i yeah. don't like always feeling like the dumb person in the room even when it's just me and leona i know and that, this <sighs> was like our plan and our game and our idea and i feel like they've kind of taken over and done all the smart stuff you and Leona will actually make quite the ragtag team one day because oh you come up with all the mysteries and she's got all the solutions. Yeah, I'm just like, what if? And uh, someone <laughs> and else she, has to do it for me. And Leona's <laughs> like, here's what you do, mom. And she pulls the pacifier out of her mouth like it's a cigarette. <laughs> and she's like, you take all the towels and you hang them out the windows. <laughs> I've heard Funkle Lem talk about this. <laughs> So anyway, they went, th- they, the story goes that after, first of all, how many fucking towels do you have for a place that has that many goddamn I mean, windows? Yeah. That's a lot of windows. I Imagine have... being like, here's what we're going to do while he's out grabbing milk. We're going to go to every 400 windows. And throw... <laughs> Can you imagine the, the poor staff who works there, like goes to do the laundry and they're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> are you telling me I need to wash 450 towels? <laughs> also like there's no way you have time to recollect all the towels and fold them back perfectly before he gets home he's gonna know something's going on yeah you're in trouble 
Anyway, maybe he maybe that was like back in the day, their version of going out was like, I'm going to take my 20 mile an hour carriage right. into the other town and spend the summer there. And spend the- <laughs> I'm going to go pick up milk for the summer and I'll be back. <laughs> the cow hasn't been born yet. I'll be back um, with some some butter because uh, yeah. it's definitely not going to be milk anymore. <laughs> So uh, anyway, they threw all the towels, uh, hung them over the windows and went outside and l- to look. And apparently the story goes that there were a few uh, mm. windows missing towels. And so they were able to see where this where the secret room they didn't have access to was. Wow. Um, there's also rumors of guests trying to count all of the windows on the outside of the castle and then count all the windows on the inside of the castle and they don't add up. So there's Ooh. some that are missing if you are looking outside. So here's one of the main theories i gave you some of like oh the vampire kid here like some there's two solid well-known theories on what the secret room might hold in it okay um so one of them is that in 1486 there were two clans in the area that were fighting they were called the Lindsay clan and the ogilvy clan ogilvy ogilvy clan so the Lindsays and the ogilvys were fighting and the Ogilvies came to the castle looking for a place to hide. And the Earl ushered them in, said, quick, come in, come in, and brought them into this room in the cellar, locked them inside, and never returned. Ah. Because apparently earlier in that day, he had made a deal with the <gasps> Lindsays. Oh, no. That he would trap the Ogilvies inside and let them starve to death. Oh, that's fucked up. So there's a few versions. Uh, different sources said weeks later months later years later so you know whatever you want um the earl was out one day getting butter from the other town or something in the (laughs) summer and the servants heard noises coming from somewhere in the castle so they went looking around and they found the secret room and in the room they found several skeletons laying all over the floor with one person still barely alive who had been eating his family to survive (gasps) oh And then you don't ever hear anything else. Like, did they just close the door on the that end. guy? Like, <laughs> they just like keep him in there, or like, because I would think we would know if that story was true or not if that guy was able to be found and escape and tell his story. Yeah, I would yeah, imagine the- if he was part of a clashing clan, he would have quite a lot of vengeance built up, and we would have heard about a war or something. Right, by that now. doesn't bode well for him. I mean, I guess maybe it like mentally broke him, and he just wasn't able to sure fair enough story i don't know but that's doesn't sound like it ended well no all we hear is that he was found in there and we don't know if they like let him out or anything yeah um another one of the or there's another rumor about what the secret room could hold but it seems to coincide with after walter scott's sir walter scott's visit Ah. i don't know I don't know if he's responsible for this or not but he stayed the night one time i think he was actually looking to become one of the like overnight i don't know if it was a guard or something but the source i saw it looked like he was looking for a job to actually like stay the nights and like patrol at the time oh okay and after one night he was like no thanks so (laughs) this was in 1704 and walter scott uh he actually wrote about his time there later and this is a quote from his account excuse me i burped that was not walter scott that was me (laughs) He said, as I heard door after door shut, I began to consider myself too far from the living and somewhat too near the dead. Ooh. So he felt like something eerie was going on there in 1704. And even though he wrote about his time from 1704, that account never really got published until the 1830s. So like much later. Weird. And shockingly, I don't know if really shockingly, but interestingly, after his account came out in the 1830s, the 1840s, 10 years later, is when this other rumor started about what could be in the secret room mm. of the Glom's castle. So I don't know if this was a random theory and Walter Scott's account came out at the same time and that kind of pushed the mystere. I don't right. totally know. But um, this is the, the main theory, I think, of what people know the Glom's castle for. The secret was that there is a hidden chamber in the castle that hid the Earl's son and rightful heir to the family's fortune. And his, the son was named Thomas Bowes Lyon. 
He was born in 1821 and he was, quote, sorry, everybody, horribly malformed. And I was afraid we would end up in something like this. Yeah, it seems to be. I feel like I feel like this isn't even the first castle where we've had like a Quasimodo situation. Yeah, like, yeah. Like uh, as far hiding as away someone who looks different. Like, right. So, um, here's a quote. Oh, was uh, that girl? You told a story about a girl who had like blue skin or purple skin or something. Mm. Or, or maybe her hair. Her hair was blue. No, something was blue. Violetta, something like that. Aquafina was what I thought. And I know that's I know that's not right. No, I think it was Aqua something. Oh, maybe. Yeah, Aqua cause blue. I right, don't know. Right. I don't know. But you're right. There was someone else who got hidden away because she was different. Mm-hmm, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So um not only was there one source calling him, quote, horribly malformed, here is a uh whole quote describing him. Oh boy. He is so unrepresentable. Oh no. Oh, he is so unpresentable that it is necessary to keep him out of sight and out of possession. A monster was born into the family. Okay. He was the he was the heir, a creature fearful to behold. It was impossible to allow this deformed caricature of humanity Stop. to be seen even by their friends. His chest, an enormous barrel, hairy as a doormat. His head ran straight into his shoulders, and his arms and legs were toy-like. And then in different sources, he was referred to as a human toad and an enormous flabby egg. This poor guy. Poor kid. If this is... I hope it's not real, but... I I don't... I'm not... I don't know. So here's the reason... uh, The theory is that he was obviously uh, tucked away from society, but the story on paper goes that the baby died only a few hours after being born. Okay. Um, that's what official documentation say, but then other people would are realizing like, Oh, there's no gravestone marker. There's no proof that he was buried anywhere, but there is proof of a baptism. And so now the rumor has spread into, Oh, for, uh, for the public, they made it seem as if he died and they faked his own death, but really he's been alive living in the castle this whole time. Oh God. So, and he's now known as the monster of Glom's castle. Oh boy. This is dark. And so they would lock him away during the day to hide him from friends and family and the public. But at night, the monster of Glom's would be allowed out of his room for air great lo- how nice yeah thank you and locals would catch a glimpse of the monster and so that is that's one of the haunts of like oh you might see the monster walking around the castle at night mm. part of the property is actually called the mad earl's walk and some think that it was named the mad earl's walk because of how the monster would walk around at night oh yeah um, again, there's another rumor of a workman who allegedly ran into the monster who, by the way, they named Thomas, but then after he allegedly died, they had another son and they also named him Thomas. Oh, great. Excellent. So like, it's like completely like removed this kid Ooh. from their life. So, uh, Thomas quote the monster. Yikes. Um, a workman allegedly ran into him while working and they, he caught Thomas in the middle of one of his midnight walks where he was quote, let out for air. Um, and he was also paid off by the Earl and told to move out of the country. Jeez. Uh, legend has it that Thomas lived for over a hundred years and died in the 1920s and his room was walled up for good. Uh, and the story about the monster was featured in the New York Times in 1864 and Oxford University Press in 1908. And he also may have inspired the 1950s 3D movie called The Maze. So if you see any 3D. similarities, I know. So if you uh, are into 1950s 3D flicks, go check, out the, go check out The Maze and tell me <laughs> if it seems similar to what I'm talking about. And as if, uh, um, hmm, if this was a secret, it would make sense why as of the 1960s, 
um, no Earl has heard about the family secret since. So when we say the family secret of Glom's castle, oh. since the 60s, no Earl knows what the fuck the secret is anymore. Like it died with one of the previous generations. Oh. And if this was, if the secret was about Thomas the monster and he died, then I guess there's no reason to have a secret anymore because the secret could die with him and so, they have no shame anymore. Right. So there's not th still three people who know it to this day. It's like nobody no. knows it. That's what I think. That's what I'm gathering. So there, the 16th Earl was in the nine. Uh, he was around in the 1960s, and he said that the secret died with either his father or his brother who was killed in the war. Mm. Um. And if the if it really was about the monster mm -hmm. or something like that, then since the scandal was dead, then I guess there was no point in having the secret anymore. Yeah, yeah. But I but I also wonder why, like, what was why would like that estate manager like be so scared to live? That's in what the I castle didn't and totally get. That part doesn't seem to make much sense. Um, what does some, make sense is like some the guy who said like, if you hear it, you'll wish it wasn't you because like what a horrific thing to learn that you're like keeping yeah this person behind i mean it's yeah. very disturbing yeah and i think that story is also what um the spin-off of the vampire child came from of like oh there's a monster in the oh, walls okay. yeah that was born into the family or mm -hmm. some whatever the horrible jargon is but um but so that seems to be like the best known secret. And on top of it, the story of like the skeletons being found in the walls because those two clans were clashing. Um, those are the two main things that people think the family secret could be. But I also don't think either of those are like horrible. I mean, I think they're horrible, but I don't think they're like horrible enough that people would be afraid, like need to be, especially the skeleton one. We're like, oh, we locked a family away in the 1400s, but then like 300 years later, an estate manager is afraid to stay there. That's the you one know? that that's the one story I can't wrap my head around the guy who's who had to get out. I mean, maybe that was just part of the rumors of like, oh, the secret's so bad he won't even stay the night. Like maybe that just didn't yeah. even happen, or maybe yeah, because you'd have to be afraid for your life. I think if if yeah. you were if you had to, if you were so desperate to get out. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Some people actually think some people in the family even thought that, oh, the secret is that there is no secret. And it's just to That's like, what I was wondering, too. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's just something so horrific that it's just going to keep us all on our toes or like keep right. us in the, in this. I don't know. Not in society's good graces, but at least keep people talking about like us notoriety or something. or something. Yeah. So we don't know what the secret is, but uh I think since the 1960s, the secret has has died out. Do you have a guess? No, I would imagine it's just that there's no secret. Mm. I really hope it's not the the monster of Glom's castle. I do one. too. I don't want that to be the truth. Obviously, I think I'm almost fine with any of the other things. <laughs> I'm totally cool with the vampire child thing. Yeah, I mean, well, not not him being locked in the house, but not, I, yeah. <laughs> the existence of one is pretty dope. Um, no, I I think there's just no secret. Yeah, I that's think maybe bizarre. Honestly, one thing that they never even covered, which I would be open to, is like there being a secret that has something to do with like Freemasons or something, mm. like some sort of like, you know, organization having like a or a society having a secret in the castle. Yeah, well, they did say like a room that with occult practices, right? Like maybe, yeah, because that was one of the. Okay, I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, oh, cool cool fun um i completely forget what i was gonna say but that's bizarre i wonder i wonder if we'll ever know or if there was no secret or it, it is it's like kind of annoying because the fact that we don't know makes it so much more interesting yeah <laughs> but i want to know so bad <laughs> i i know well i think the i think they were hoping that just like some nosy gemini's would hear their story one day and we would be like god Tell us, please, God. It's just their luck. <laughs> I know. Who stepped onto the scene. Do you have a guess at all? Um, I feel like I could see it being another one of those disturbing stories, like the monster of Gloms, where it's like, oh, like there was a, a defor especially because like you hear about a lot of these families marry into each other and then, you know, birth. Yeah. Like, uh, 
deformities happen, that kind of thing. And I don't know. I, I don't want that to be it. But I, I could sort of see how a royal family might be like, we don't want that to be presented to the public. I mean, um, as I don't agree with it, but I can certainly sure. if someone told me that, like, you know, a, a family line that's huge in the public eye would care about looks like right, I would right. not be surprised, especially like, quote unquote, back <clears throat> in the day, like not, yeah. you know, but so I, I really hope that's not the truth. But um, that would be disturbing to find out that your family is keeping like a child or whoever in a walled off room. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, on top of the uh, mystere of this castle, there are a few ghosts. Okay, that's what I was going to say. That is when I lost my train of thought. I knew you would pull it, pull it I got you. in for I got me. You. Thank don't, you. Don't you worry, my little bunny rabbit. Or what did you call me before we started <laughs> I recording? I called you my gay bunny because you said you were wearing a shirt with oh, yeah. bunny ears and gay color, rainbow my colors. My shirt, if you're watching YouTube, uh, I have a, a subtly gay shirt. Maybe not so subtle, but more subtle than others. Yeah. Uh, I, a gay pride shirt and the brand is like something bunny yeah and it was like a facebook ad or something yeah i don't don't know what it is it's got a bunny on it bunny ears is the logo but um christine called me her gay little bunny my little gay bunny and then you were like you're my little carrot (laughs) yeah oh oh, i love our love i love our love too it's just so uh it's just so wonderful Mm. I, I'm going to end while we're ahead because I almost made it weird. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. I just am so good at it. So uh, the ghosts. So what I saw in most of the sources is that there's definitely at least nine ghosts. Okay. But some sources said up to 20 ghosts. Okay. Um, but most sources were like nine is the number. Okay. Wow. They were very fervent on that. My mistake. I'll keep it a nine. Yeah. So the main one, or one of the main ones, is the Grey Lady, which in moments like this, I don't know why they didn't call her the Grady. Um, <laughs> but she is thought to be the wife of the sixth Earl, and her name was Lady Janet Douglas. So in 1537, her husband died. And I think there was some politics uh, surrounding this. And it basically came to people thinking that Lady Janet poisoned her own husband and she was ultimately accused of witchcraft and burned at the stake. Oh, excellent. When she probably did nothing. Yeah. So, uh, and her ghost can be found lurking in the clock tower. And mm. she's also often seen in the chapel praying at the altar. Mm. Um, doesn't feel like a witch thing to do, sad. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like she's like still trying to like repent Proof or something. herself or something. Um, fun fact, there is a seat reserved for her in the chapel that nobody else is allowed to sit at. Nice. Um, I don't know if she actually uses that chair because she's usually seen standing at the altar or kneeling at the altar. Right. And when people have seen her in the chapel, they will often see her disappear into a wall. Hmm. The visitors uh, coming into the chapel are also told to knock three times to make themselves known for her so she won't scare them or they won't scare her. Um, Your camera just went blurry. Oh. Put your hand up to it maybe and then like pull it away. Oh, there it goes. It's back. That was weird. Sorry. Well, it's just you were just in a haze looking at me. I guess so. It hurt my head, though. (laughs) Actually, can you imagine if it didn't blur at all? And that was just your first sign into the COVID world. (laughs) Oh, no. It's like, nope, your eyes are just stuck all cross-eyed. Em, you're so attractive that it makes my throat, my glands swell up. My throat hurt. You were about to say throat and then caught yourself. or Something happened where you only said the TH and I was scared to death you were going to say thneed. (gasps) I love having this power over you. It's really just like a fight or flight experience (laughs) at all moments with you. Um, Okay. So other than the Grady, uh, ancestors, several. Oh, actually, here's a super creepy thing about her. Not only is she seen in the chapel um, and in the clock tower, but there's one story of someone actually seeing her as they were driving in to the castle and she glided next to their car the whole ride there. Ew! I would turn right around that little cult. You know they have one of those pretty driveways that's a big circle. <laughs> Just turn right around. I'd do a sharp U-turn and hit her on the way out. I'd yeah, like, yeah. Get good out. Point. Don't even get all the way in. Um, so that is the first ghost. And then another one is the tongueless lady. Cool. Excellent. Mm-hmm. 
She is known to wander the castle and she is screaming silently while pointing at her mouth, which has blood pouring out of it. Oh my, what the fuck? The story goes that she was an employee who overheard the Earl and his estate manager talking about the secret. That's not her fault. Oh, well, apparently, but- well, here's the thing. Apparently the secret was so horrific that she threatened to tell people and expose them. Why would you Which, threaten? Like, just go know, do it. Just leave. Pretend you didn't see a goddamn thing. Have you? Is this your first rodeo? Clearly not a Gemini. I don't know what she was, but like ears oh no. open, mouth shut. That is the rule at all Thank times. Thank you, M. Um, but so she threatened to tell people, and the Earl had a guard chase her down, cut her tongue out, and kill Holy her. Holy shit! I don't know if that's real or not, but. I know you're right. Yeah, I'm. I, I sure hope not. Either way, people now see a ghost whose mouth is just pouring out blood, and she's trying to tell the secret. Oh, how spooky! Um, here's the worst thing you're gonna hear. Oh, great. You're not gonna hear it right away, but we're gonna get there. And it's, I don't, know, I don't want to talk about it, but we're gonna have to. So there's another ghost called Earl Beardy, like a beard. Beardy. Okay. He was the fourth Earl of Crawford. Uh, his name was actually Alexander Lindsay. So he was one of the Lindsays. Oh, okay. Of the clan. So Earl Beardy, he's one of the most active spirits here. He was known as a person to be a terrible, terrible person. And he drank a lot and he liked to make people miserable, which is an understatement. Okay. Um, so there's a few versions of the ghost story involving him. But I think the the gist of it is one night he was visiting the castle and he was playing cards. He got super drunk and he was demanding someone to play another round with him. And I guess people weren't willing to play or someone was saying like, hey, maybe you should stop playing. I don't really know what the deal was. But eventually, as he was saying, I'm going to I need to play another round. He said, I will play uh, cards, even if it's only with the devil himself. <gasps> and soon there was a knock on the door and someone, a man well-dressed walks into the billiard room and nobody knows who he is. And I this, do. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> and, uh, the man sits down with Beardy and plays games with him all night, plays cards with him. And I guess people, uh, could hear them in this room just like shouting and cussing and playing rolling dice and playing cards all night long um apparently one servant even went to go look through the keyhole to like see what they were up to and all he could see was a beaming bright light Mm. that allegedly blinded him in that eye afterwards whoa and or according to a different version he was zapped into flames oh okay okay sorry (laughs) i got a second you're fine. That one that one got me of like zapped into flames and he <laughs> lived to tell the tale. Okay. <laughs> oh, he lived oh, to yeah, tell yeah. the tale? I thought he died right there and someone well, was like, did, well, I'm not looking in that any, keyhole. I don't know how anyone else would have known that he was zapped into flames if he didn't tell them, but I don't well, know. Couldn't they see him? Oh, I don't know. Like he peeks in a burst into flames and they're like, don't look in that fucking keyhole. Nothing good happens. Good point. I don't know. But I don't know. Uh, it, it's not so anyway, good. So they're the devil in theory and Beardy are playing cards and they're making a raucous noise all night long. And uh, some people say that Beardy is cursed to play forever because he was gambling with the devil on the Sabbath. Oh, and so God forbid, literally. God forbid. So he's still seen around the castle um, as a tall, scary looking man, and he sometimes wakes people up by touching their cheek or standing over them and s- staring at them. Yuck. Um, one guest actually woke up from a cold air and saw a figure of a man in what looked like knight's armor. Uh, and then he watched the knight walk into the children's room and moments later heard the children scream. <gasps> and they said that they were woken up by a knight peering over them in bed. Ugh. Here's the horrible part. So when I said Beardy was a terrible man and that was an understatement, one of the things he did for fun um, on the property is he stripped a servant. And I don't know, by the way, if this is a servant or an enslaved person, but let's roll with enslaved person. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
I don't I don't know what was going on at the time, so I don't know what the right jargon is, but sure. this feels like something you could only do to an enslaved person. Yeah. Um he stripped the enslaved person nude and then hunted him for fun. <gasps> and yeah. the dogs tore him apart allegedly. <gasps> God. Yeah. And Jesus. so that servant is now said to be one of the spirits. Horrible. They call him Jack the Runner because he was running away, obviously. Oh, and sake. he apparently looks very scared. And basically, if you ever see anyone running on the grounds, it might be him. That's um, it's fucked up. I tried to warn you. And uh, he's also known to pull pranks on people staying there, which like, first of all fucking let him like uh, right if, if that's the worst that he wants to do geez apparently he's known to trip people which like he fucking deserves it if that's what's happening like he deserves a lot more and like mm. anyway so it, there's a allegedly the ghost of a servant who pulls pranks on people and i don't know if they're the same or not but if it's this poor soul who mm. died that way you could be doing a lot worse and people should be turning a blind eye every time agreed as for the other ghosts people see faces and windows they hear footsteps they hear hammering they hear banging i wonder if the hammering is like part of the lore of like they were building up false walls or Ooh, walling yeah. people in people hear banging they hear knocking they feel cold spots and they see apparitions in the courtyard and apparitions looking out the windows at you Ugh. there's also a hangman's chamber where apparently a butler hanged himself and mm -hmm. he is known to maybe still haunt that area. And during world war one, this was used as a war hospital. So tack on all the spirits of soldiers that of might be lingering here. But for the most part, that is the Glom's castle. I didn't cover all nine ghosts. I kind of clumped them together, but those were the main ones. So kind of glommed them together. Ah, anyway, there's the Glom's castle. Um, that was one of my favorite stories you've done in a long time. I just really liked it. I don't believe you, really. I didn't yeah. think that. I was. I go into a lot of the stories thinking, "Oh, this is going to be a winner," and I didn't feel that with this one. I thought this was just a story. No, I really liked it. I think I just kind of like the mystique and like the secrets and the and the fact that like it wasn't debunked. You know what I mean? Mm. I feel like sometimes it's just kind of like at the end, it's like it's all very spooky, but then it's like, but it's probably not true. I feel like this one, there's still some like mystery. You know what I mean? There's definitely something that the family at least passed on to one another. That's right. very exclusive it's and pretty weird family. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, anyway, and it's and certainly, it's oh my certainly gosh. said to be haunted. So that, that part I can tell you with certainty. <laughs> certainty. On Beach Too Sandy, I lit it once, and I was like, Em got me this cool candle, and let's just say chaos ensued, and uh, there's multiple TikToks I have no idea what you're talking about. about it now. What? I did, I did light it, and it's... <laughs> you just have to watch it. Should, should I watch them now or later? Watch it right now. Okay. Is it your TikTok? <laughs> it's the Beach Too Sandy TikTok. Oh, God. By the way, folks, go follow that. It's... Uh, we have some fun times over there. Beach too, Sandy. Okay. Um, let's see. For, wait, hold on. Let me tell you which one to follow. So, so there's Coffin Candles first. Watch that uh -huh. one first. It has 33,000 views. I see Coffin Candle. Watch You're just that bragging that you've gotten 33,000 No, because views. it's tagged you. It's only because it's about you. Holding a <laughs> It okay, doesn't now, like watch the, now watch how badly the next, so it's in one right after that about candle the candle death. of death, yes. <laughs> it really, I, here's the thing though, I think you were actually smelling Squidward burning because uh -oh. I, because that candle does not have a smell when it was lit in my house. Well, that's what I said. Oh, I said it's, there's like a part when we actually recorded the podcast episode, there's a part where you can hear me say like, oh, it smells just like candle. Like it doesn't smell like anything. And then like yeah. after like an hour, we were like, what is that smell? And it just smelled so I think strongly. you were singeing Krampus. I, think I don't you were. know. Okay. Well, maybe. Let, I think you were summoning them. Also, I will warn you, that's got to be on a plate because the entire thing literally melts into a puddle. Well, but don't worry. Everyone on TikTok told me, like, please stop. They didn't say please. They said stop fucking lighting giant candles that uh, are top oh, could you heavy. Been burning? I was going to say, could you be burning the shelf? 
I could be doing a lot of things. And oh my god! That's I. I don't know, but the the candle. Um, can this be the continuation TikTok on your beach to Santa? <laughs> <laughs> but like, this is only as far as we got. It was so tragic. Yeah, there's something you're burning. Something that uh, is not the candle. Okay, well, I'm gonna try it later. It might be the plastic on that shelf. Nothing's burnt over here, though. Look underneath the bot the shelf. Is it, there anything in? Just a like, little bit. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you, we burnt that whole thing in like three days. Never once even smelled a single thing. Seriously? The entire candle was gonzo in like 36 hours and we okay, never smelled so anything. I must have just been ignoring everyone on TikTok and really creating a fire hazard. And <laughs> I, I do apologize. By the way, I do love that I got a little like a little shout out on your you, Beach to Sandy TikTok. All we do is talk about you. It's it's actually probably very annoying for Alexander, but here we oh, are. Well, we talk about him a lot on this show, so I guess it's just a I nice guess little that's fair. That's true. Anyway, I'm sorry. Sorry for that little uh little side tangent um i had a great time (laughs) also but uh, before we get going though Uh in the tiktok where you talked about how you nailed squidward to the wall Mm. with in his head i gotta be honest not a single part of that surprises me after being friends with you i do think it's really sick but i (laughs) also i I was like finally someone's on my side (laughs) i mean i'm on your side as in like i get that he is floppy and you needed a quick fix because you you do not do well with slow fixes. So I certainly don't. A nail Thank of the you head for was understanding me. I do know if I left you in a room and I gave you a task, you would find the fastest way to do it. Which, by the way, is why I'm convinced you also have ADHD, my friend. Because yeah, I mean, the more that I um, learn about it and talk to Blaze and hear about it, I'm like, oh yeah, that. But I'm also like, doesn't everyone do that? And then he's like, no. So mm, I guess no. I'm, learn- no. I'm learning. If you would also, uh, listeners, if you would also nail Squidward to the wall via his head and not even think (laughs) twice about it, you might have ADHD. I didn't think twice, but I did apologize because I do also have some some pretty strong OCD tendencies and I felt like maybe I was causing him some emotional trauma, but I did apologize, so... I, um, you know what? You found the fastest way to, to a solution like, and I got to give it to you. I'm going to tell you on the comments, you should go read the comments later. Like here's one comment. No walls are safe with Christina and her pocket full of nails because of your <laughs> curtain stories. Like the, the comments on here are basically like about me nailing curtains to the wall and how you're going to feel about this. And so I feel like well, Christine, you... I, they're 100 percent right. If I left you with a hammer, nails <laughs> and things that needed to be attached to anything, I know exactly how they would get attached. <laughs> if I left you with tape or nails or glue, you'll always pick nails. There's something kind of wrong with you and with your relationship with nails. They work better. I mean, I did go to Catholic school and I did learn a lot about nailing people's, you know, wrists versus hands to the please, wall, to the please cross. don't refer to Squidward as Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not. To be clear, I'm not. I his mean, you can with free. me. There's no stigmata. I promise. Um, <laughs> just, just through his fucking head. Only through the back of the head. It's fine. He's fine. It's fine. We're all fine. Um but yeah, a lot of those comments reference you, M, so you might want to read them. Thank but you. The longer we talk about this, though, wow, the worse it gets. Yeah, I feel like maybe I should have just shut up and said, yeah, I've never lit that candle. Um, Next time someone asks about Squidward being nailed to the wall, just say, well, I was raised Catholic. so I was, and I don't know what anybody wants me to do about it, except just reenact the trauma that I had to watch over and over again. Honestly, it's like playing dollhouse in a therapy session. So yep. whatever. I get Thank it. You. It's okay. Thank you. It's okay. All Moving right, on quickly on, to the real murder that you're to going to the discuss actual today. trauma, right. Today, I'm covering a story that I had never heard of somehow because it is so up our alley, down our alley, up our street. I don't know. Across the it's street. Across the street. It's called Teresita Bassa and her murder. And I'm just going to read a line. Uh, this was written in an article by Vernita Vergara uh, on the lineups website. And this basically sums up, like, why this is such a perfect story. I almost wish I'd, like, saved it for some, I don't know, special event, event. special day. But here it is. Quote, true crime aficionados and fans of the supernatural and bizarre make up two distinct demographics. Members of one group may also belong to the other, like, overlapping circles in a Venn diagram. But it's rare to find a case that straddles the divide. 
straddles. Well, I so, don't like that word. But okay, I like how that's what it. you take out of this. I know. Okay. I, ooh, ah, I do. Did, I do like that. They're going to combine forces like we have with this podcast. Well, yeah. And that's so this, this story is like a paranormal slash true crime story. I feel like they're so rare for some reason. Like we don't we've covered f- all the ones we thought we knew. I feel like the only ones that we've ever covered before were when like a ghost through a Ouija board, like confessed to a murder or something. Well, we did like, like Velisca Axe murder. You did that one. Oh, yeah. 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 I will still never get over the fact that. Uh, well, maybe we'll do that a switch every one day because I've always wanted to cover that, but um, you did already did a good job on it, so I probably shouldn't. What? But... Oh, and Volska axe murder? Yeah, I do feel bad in hindsight that I did. No, I don't... you shouldn't feel bad. It is very haunted, but hmm. we really should have. This is why we should have learned a long time ago to just tell each other what our topics are, so we can combine forces. But there's we'll a lot of learn. things we'll never learn. There's a lot of things. We'll never learn. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, okay. So some of the sources I used were Unsolved Mysteries, uh, and it was actually on the show in 1990, this story. Hmm. Uh, all That's Interesting, PoliceOne.com, The Lineup, and this really amazing article by Jen Baxter on Medium. Oh, and uh, there was an article on Morbidology that I'm going to mention later, too, uh, Morbidology.com. Okay. And th- those were all the sources. Okay. So let's crack into it, Emothy. Hmm. Teresita Basa was born in 1929, raised in the Philippines. After getting her bachelor's from Assumption College in Manila, she decided to move to the U.S. to get a master's degree in music from Indiana University. And although she never lost her love for music, she ultimately decided to transition into medicine and became a respiratory therapist. So now we're fast forwarding to 1977. Teresita is 47 years old. She's living in Chicago. She's leading a happy life as a respiratory therapist, and she works at a hospital called Edgewater Hospital. And now I have a fun fact about the hospital. Hmm. According to All That's Interesting, the hospital, which was located just outside of Chicago, Illinois, once boasted Frank Sinatra as a patient and was the birthplace of serial killer John Wayne Gacy and Hillary Rodham Clinton. Whoa. Weird, Big right? Thing. Big things happen in there. This is like a lot of a lot of stuff going on, like across I, the board. I would love to look up my hospital and see if anyone notorious besides me has been born there. Yeah. How do you even look that up? Like, I don't I know don't if know that, that would Are be. You, I don't know. I don't know if I that would know. be anywhere public. You know how hmm. like colleges have like notable alumni. I feel like hospitals <laughs> should have that too. Right. You know? They're like we had so much. But then if it's like John Wayne Gacy, it's like. I feel like that would be something you would not want to be bragging about bragging about. (laughs) I do feel like notable alumni is a pretty diplomatic category. You're completely right. You're completely right. It's not giving them any more or less better or worse credibility. You know. Okay. But I do wonder, like, do you think John Wayne Gacy's alma mater has him on the list? That's a great point. And no, I don't think he deserves. You don't. I'm more curious. I really wonder. I, I feel like if it were a Wikipedia page, I feel like he should not be listed because he doesn't deserve the extra publicity. Yeah. But I do think maybe in the text he should be mentioned. Uh, like, like you have to do the reading to find him. I versus... feel like the opposite, actually. I feel like it would be on oh. Wikipedia because that's a more just like public, like anybody can edit that and add the information. Whereas like the school curates their own documents mm-hmm. and might be like, let's just not mention him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who I don't knows? Know. Somebody probably knows. So let us know if you know. <laughs> okay. I'm curious. Well, I will say I was in my notable alumni on my college's Wikipedia for like three months and then someone erased me. <laughs> so oh. I didn't, and someone, put, someone else put me there. I didn't put myself there, which like, I was like, oh my God, I made it. And then it got taken down and I went, never mind. <laughs> oh my God. I wonder, that's, wow. I yeah, guess you're not I notable know. enough. Not to one person. <laughs> i like to think one i like to think the president of my college he's like 80 years old and just sitting at the computer being like absolutely not delete, delete off of wikipedia delete. <laughs> delete okay so that's just a fun fact about the hospital uh where she worked so around this time teresita also decided to go back to school to get her doctorate because oh, i guess okay. she is a smart cookie and so she decides she's going to get her doctorate uh in music at Loyola University of Chicago. 
fun. So she was known as reliable, led a quiet and unassuming life, and even gave piano lessons out of her home during her free time, which, Hmm. uh, as you can imagine, her free time was very limited because she's getting a PhD and also working (laughs) full time. Yeah. 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 So Monday, February 21st, 1977 had been a pretty routine day for Teresita. She worked her normal shift at the hospital, then headed home to her apartment. And around 7.30 p.m., she received a phone call from her friend Ruth, who worked at the hospital with her. They talked for like 20, 30 minutes. And then Teresita said, oh, hey, I got to get off the phone. I'm expecting a male visitor. Like she's expecting someone to come over. And Ruth didn't ask for the man's name or any other details. So... Almost an hour later, a couple down the hall thought they smelled smoke. Wow, oh, shit. They informed the janitor, who immediately called the Chicago Fire Department and started evacuating residents. And by the time firefighters rushed into the building, the hallway was filling with smoke. Oh. Firefighters quickly determined that the source of the smoke was apartment 15B, which was Teresita's apartment. They forced entry into her home and were able to extinguish the flames in minutes. But once the fire was out, they found that the source of the fire was a mattress that had been set ablaze. Oh, okay. They lifted the mattress and were shocked to find the body of Teresita Bassa. Mm -hmm. She was nude and she had a butcher knife embedded in her chest. Holy shit. Wow. Okay. So this person really, this was not an accident at all. Certainly not. And oh my um, God. they went in assuming that the fire had been an accident and then quickly realized that was not the case. Yeah. So detectives were called to the scene and confirmed they were dealing with a homicide. Um, it appeared that whoever had killed Teresita had lit the fire to try and cover up the evidence sure. basically. So trying to cover yeah. up the murder. Um, so the murderer had thrown a pile of her clothing on top of her body, lit the clothing on fire, then had put the mattress on top and lit the mattress on fire as well. Oof. It's just really oh disturbing. God. And this was what? 77? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So an autopsy determined that despite what investigators expected, Teresita had not been sexually assaulted prior to her death. Uh, and on because her body was found nude, so they thought that might have been part of the MO, but it was not. And on top of that, a search of the apartment led to no physical evidence that could point to the killer. So they flew Teresita's body back to the Philippines for burial, um, and it was obvious that Teresita's apartment had been ransacked and that a struggle had taken place, but they weren't able to determine. She lived alone, and so it was really hard for them to determine, like, what was missing, mm-hmm. um, like, what was there that no longer wasn't. So they were just kind of a shit out of luck because nobody could tell them, like, what looked off or what looked different. So finding clues was really hard. Uh, the only clue they could find was a note that Teresita had written, which read, get theater tickets for A.S. Hmm. But they had no idea who Who A.S. AS was. was. So detectives spent the next several weeks interviewing Teresita's friends, coworkers, neighbors, and classmates. Uh, They learned she was kind, quiet, polite. She was dedicated to her job. And although she did date occasionally, she wasn't married. And mostly across the board, people were just shocked that someone had wanted to hurt her because she was just such a docile, gentle person. Sure. For this reason, detectives had no leads and the case went cold. Hmm. Until six Whoa. months later. Oh, okay. I thought I was afraid you were going to say like until 2022. And I was <laughs> no, like, thank no. God. Thank God it was faster than that. Uh, so in July of 1977, the police department received a call from a man named Dr. Jose Chua Jr. Uh, a doctor who lived in a suburb of Chicago called Skokie and worked as a surgical assistant at Franklin Boulevard Community Hospital. Dr. Chua said he had information about Teresita's murder. So police went to his house to interview him. At first, Dr. Chua seemed embarrassed. Like Embarrassed? Yeah, like he didn't want to share what he knew. Uh, Oh, okay. And how he got it. But after a few minutes of small talk, he finally asked the officers if they believed in the supernatural or the occult. Oh, shut up. Oh, my God. Hang on. So the way the years, it's 1977. Ah, I was hoping there'd be like a spiritualism factor here. But. Nope. Not okay. yet. Okay. So they were polite, but they clearly thought like this is a wasted trip. We just 
like wasted our time on some, you know, rando calling us yeah. and saying I have information. Um, but they waited him out and hurt, you know, heard him out. And finally, Dr. Chua told them why he was asking and what had happened. It turns out his wife, Remy Chua, was having what she called visions or what he called visions about Teresita's murder. Oh, shit. So Remy was actually a co-worker of Teresita's at Edgewater Hospital and had also emigrated from the Philippines. And at first she attempted to ignore these nightmares, but they continued to happen. They persisted. And what would happen in the dreams is she would be standing in the locker room at work and she would see her friend Teresita Bassa and then she would see a man's face behind her. And then the dream would end. And she kept having these dreams. Um, and she she would try to ignore them, but things escalated. So one day while she was taking a nap, she went into a sort of trance-like state and started speaking to her husband in someone else's voice. What? Hang on. <laughs> so wait. Okay, so she's speaking in like... Uh, okay, got it. I'm, I'm on board, but I'm like not uh, totally on board. Like- I mean, it, it really sounds like one of your stories. Yeah, and now I know why you always seem a little confused. Why like, I go, like, okay. Yeah, it's uh, just yeah. like, what? So she's so, like, so someone else is talking through her. Exactly. So okay. Dr. Chua explained it as almost a comatose state, and he didn't recognize the voice his wife was speaking in. So suddenly his wife started speaking Tagalog, and she told oh. him that her name was Teresita Basa, and her killer was still at large. Well, I think we did know that since the case was cold. Yes. Oh, okay. but yeah. Yes. <laughs> so far, well, we're yeah, not tell learning me something. It. I don't know, Teresita. <laughs> <laughs> like not to be a dick, but like, yeah, girl, we know. Em is not impressed. Okay. <laughs> I am. I am. I am. I am. <laughs> so this voice of Teresita proceeded to go into full detail about her murder and even named her killer. Hmm. She told Doctor Chua through his wife, that she had been stabbed to death by an orderly at Edgewater Hospital named Alan Showery. Oh, A.S. A.S. You ding, ding, ding. Uh, When asked why she let him into her home, Teresita's voice explained that Alan was a friend and he had arrived at her apartment to help fix her TV, but had attacked her while he was in her apartment. So she asked Dr. Shua to go to the police and then the voice faded away. When Remy woke up, she remembered none of it. No memory okay. of this happening. Interesting. Well, okay. I'm, tr- I'm trying to, I'm trying, not, it's not you. It's not your storytelling. I'm trying to like put it together in my head of like, hmm, how could this go? How could this go? How could this go? Any theories or thoughts? The only theory I have, which like so far, I don't know if this like even has any weight at this point, but there's a Law and Order SVU episode where the, the case there <laughs> they're trying to crack the case and all of a sudden out of nowhere this medium comes to the the right whatever it's called their office i remember this episode and he's like oh i could let me i let me tell you like i see her lying by a body of water and mm-hmm. blah, blah blah and he ended up being the killer yeah i mean that S- sounds like uh that sounds I like mean, an SVU episode. <laughs> sounds like dun 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 dun. <laughs> no, I, it just uh, so in my mind, I'm immediately ready to jump to like, oh, this person who's like telling them information knows the information because they're the killer. Which yeah, I, I can I can literally see Finn Tutuola being like, this crackpot comes in. Like I can see the <laughs> whole fucking conversation. You mean to tell me there are killers on the street? <laughs> like, yeah, dude. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah where have you been bud (laughs) it's like we've been doing this together for a long time now (laughs) all right sorry sorry sorry. Uh, okay so when remy woke up she remembered nothing at first the two of them decided not to go to the police for fear they would sound foolish and they didn't want to draw attention to themselves because they were like well we have information about this crime and they're going to be like how do you have this information are you involved so basically what you're saying and they were like we were too freaked out that we were going to get pulled into this But Teresita was not done. Uh, Her ghost was persistent. The following week, Remy was possessed by Teresita again and expressed anger at Dr. Chua for not having gone to the police. He defended himself to her and said, like, hey, I don't want to go to the police without any real evidence. Like, I can't I can't just say, oh, you talked to me through my wife. You possessed her and blah, blah, blah. I need like actual hard evidence. (laughs) Something people will pay attention to. Yeah. So Teresita gave him some. Oh, 
She told Dr. Chua that Alan Showery had taken some of her jewelry, several unique pieces that her father had purchased in France and given to her mother, and Alan Showery had given these pieces to his girlfriend. Okay. The voice even gave the names and phone numbers of four people who would be able to identify the jewelry as hers. All right. Hey, that's that's It's at least something. That's meaty. It's meatier than body of water, you know? Yeah. So now we cut to the interview with police, and this is the first time... They're, so they're kind of like eye rolling, like, okay, guy, this, they're Tutuola, like this crackpot guy is telling us all sorts of shit. Uh, but then he mentions the jewelry and they, this is the first they've heard about jewelry having been stolen. So their interest is kind of peaked, but they're still dubious, obviously. Um, this was not what they were expecting when he said he had information on the case. Uh, then again, they knew about Alan's initials, the note, AS, and that is weird. And this phone numbers. And- yeah, this guy didn't know about AS. So so they were like, that is strange that his initials would have matched. So the detectives just decided, why not? We don't have any other leads. Let's just do a background check on Alan Showery. Uh, and they noticed he lived close to Teresita. So after a coworker recalled hearing Alan mention mentioning that he would actually be fixing Teresita's television, they were like, okay, this is getting a little weird. So we're going to go pay him a visit and see what is going on. So they go to Alan's apartment on August 11th, and at first, uh, so they take him in for questioning. And at first, he admitted he knew Teresita, but said he had never been in her apartment. Um, But pretty quickly, that story falls apart, and he then says, well, he did go to her apartment to fix her TV, but he left some of his tools at home, and therefore he left shortly after arriving. Uh, And they said, well, why didn't you come back? He said, oh, he explained that he and his girlfriend had been having electrical problems at their apartment, um, so he stayed at home to fix the electrical uh, problems and didn't go back to Teresita's. So he had no Mm. idea how she ended up dead. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. So obviously they were skeptical of this story, especially because it's like changing as they interview him. Uh, So they contact Alan's girlfriend and she said electrical problems. We haven't been having any electrical problems. So Mm, first red flag. Yes. And besides, she said, Alan would have no idea how to fix any electrical issues, even if we did have some. So to me, they didn't really mention this. But to me, that's kind of red flag, too, about the television. Like, does he know how to fix the television or is this just like some bullshit thing? Yeah. If he doesn't know how to fix electrical problems, I don't know. Good I don't point. Know. Good point. So they asked whether uh, Alan had given her any jewelry recently. And she said, oh, yeah, in February, uh, he gave me a couple gifts claiming they were belated Christmas gifts. And she said, I'm even wearing two of the pieces right now and oh, showed shit. them a pearl cocktail ring and a pendant around her neck. So police contacted the four people that were mentioned uh, by Remy and all four of them said, Oh, yep. Those are Teresita's. That's (gasps) Teresita's jewelry that this woman is wearing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm at a loss now. I know. I don't don't know anymore. Bananagrams. So when police then confronted Alan and said like, Hey, so fun fact, these people say that your girlfriend is wearing Teresita's jewelry. Like how could this have happened? Um, he immediately broke down and confessed. Uh, he admitted that he had gone to Teresita's with plans to rob her for rent money. So I don't think the TV thing was ever in the cards. Uh, she let him into her apartment because she was expecting him, obviously, to repair the TV. She considered him a friend, and she had even planned to give him theater tickets as a thank you, which is why she had the note, get theater tickets for AS. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. When it came to the crime itself, Alan explained he had waited for her to turn around and lock the door, and that's when he attacked Uh, He stripped off her clothes to make it look like a sexual assault had taken place, and he stabbed her once in the chest. Holy shit. But after that, he went looking for cash, and apparently Teresita didn't keep much cash in her apartment, so he only found $30. And obviously this was not enough for rent money, so he took the jewelry in an Uh attempt to, like, make it worthwhile. Then he Mm. set the fire uh, to cover up the crime, as they had suspected. So obviously he's arrested, He his trial is set, but now he does a 180, and despite his confession earlier, Alan Showery now pleads not guilty to Teresita's murder, explaining that he was just kidding when he made the confession. But JK, wait, what? What a hilarious joke, by the way. That's the 
he should be a stand-up comedian. He should be a comedian. Agreed. Also, uh, I just such a small, stupid thing that probably is not useful to the mystery, but uh, if he stole the jewelry to help make up for rent, but then just gave it to his girlfriend, did he not really need it for rent? Yeah, that's what I thought too, but I, I wonder if he took enough that he gave like her a couple pieces and then like those were the scraps maybe yeah or Mm. like maybe he kept the unique ones so that they wouldn't be found in a pawn shop i don't know gotcha okay um because apparently the ones that she had were like very distinct like maybe he was like i don't want those floating around out there i'm not really sure but yeah it's a good question um or maybe he just was like well shit i didn't get my rent money this way i'll just grab some jewelry and find a different way to make it yeah yeah i don't don't know. know Um, So according to a really great article by Emily Thompson on Morbidology.com, during Showery's trial, prosecutor Thomas Organ roared, well, Alan Showery, you weren't kidding when you... Okay, sorry. Let me say this again because I forgot... (laughs) Please roar it this time because... Kind of goes back to the other point. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. So like I said, despite his confession, Alan pleaded not guilty to Teresita's murder, saying he had been just kidding when he made the confession. And so now, according to an article written by Emily Thompson on Morbidology.com, during the trial, the prosecutor roared, well, Alan Shorey, you weren't kidding when you plunged the knife into Teresita Bassa's chest. Uh Aha, I see the context. So, yeah. So uh, clearly the joke was not funny to anyone. uh, Right. But him himself. So during this trial, which the media, by the way, dubbed the voice from the grave trial, uh, it was very sensationalized, was like splashed across headlines all across the country. Um, Alan's defense lawyer suggested that Remy Chua faked the trances because she had been fired from the hospital. And uh, his defense lawyer said, never to my knowledge has a man been arrested because of a vision. So he his angle Mm. was like, this is all hocus pocus baloney. Right. Um, And so the trial, for what it's worth, ended in a hung jury and was therefore declared a mistrial. And so a new hearing was scheduled for February of 1979, but for unknown reasons, while waiting for his retrial, Alan had a change of heart and p- changed his plea to guilty. Oh, maybe he was just sick of waiting. I mean, that's like a year and a half of waiting for your new sentencing or your new trial, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I feel like maybe he was like, I'm already in jail. I don't know. I have no idea what his thinking would be. I guess so. But like if the chance is to get out of jail i don't know i don't know maybe yeah i guess it was just a total change of heart of like okay they're right it wasn't very funny when i stabbed her in the chest well so. here's the, what the theory on it so basically what's what probably happened is his lawyer said you need to plead guilty to get a more lenient sentence um you know if you plead guilty now we're gonna be able to get you you know whatever a lower sentence than if you went through a trial and were found guilty but there were rumors, there were whispers that perhaps Teresita's visit or spirit had also paid him a visit in jail. Ooh. Oh, okay. But I think most likely his lawyers were like, you need to plead guilty, plead guilty. and get a, better, get a better chance of getting out of here. So whatever the reason for his guilty plea, Alan was sentenced to 14 years in prison for the murder of Teresita Bassa, as well as concurrent terms of four to 12 years on the armed robbery and arson charges, which is so weird to me, like four to 12 years for robbery and arson, but 14 years only for murder. Yeah, they do not feel like they have the same weight. I don't think so. Um, And guess what? He served just under five years in prison and then was paroled. So super duper. Oh, my God. And he's just, like, still out living around now? Oh, just yeah. Just walking around? Oh, yeah. Uh, so Alan Shorey was paroled July of 1983. Evidence suggests he moved to New York City shortly after his release, but we don't really know where he went. Uh, I imagine he's trying to stay off the grid a little bit. To this day, the detectives have no other explanation for the information they received other than it being supernatural. All they know is that the intel was true and it led them to solving the case. So wow. some, some of them say, like, uh, I don't believe that it was paranormal. Some say, well, we have no other way to explain it. So it's kind of unclear, but uh, there's a mix. it's a mixed bag. Wow. That being said, there is a non—some people believe there is a non-paranormal explanation for all this. So 
some online sleuths, some web sleuths have tried to piece together what could have happened. And as it turns out, Remy and Alan weren't exactly strangers. So they actually worked at the hospital together and Alan had recently complained about Remy's work quality and she was fired because he had complained to their superiors. Okay, so this could be a revenge situation. Yes, but at the same time, like, he clearly did it. And how did she know the specifics of that? Yeah. Uh, so some know. people think she may have overheard him spilling the details to someone at work. Um, some people think that perhaps she had subconsciously pieced together, like, various suspicions, and this is how it manifested. Um, either way, it does make some sense that she suspected Alan of having killed Teresita, but was, like, too afraid to go directly to the police and say... I have these suspicions and instead kind of put it on like a paranormal ghost thing, Um, which I feel like we've talked about in one of the other cases where like the, where it was possible that the woman knew who her daughter's killer was. It was like the husband, but uh, was worried they wouldn't believe her. So she like invented a ghost and said like, Oh, the ghost is telling me it was the one that does feel real. It was the one, um, you covered it when we were on a guest episode, what were we on? What show were we on? Sinisterhood. And uh, you covered it, it, it's the guy, or wait, maybe they covered it. Sorry, they covered it. <laughs> it's the guy who, um, his he killed his wife and he had like seven wives or something. He had a ridiculous name. and uh, Oh, I wouldn't remember it. I, I wouldn't remember the name. And his mom, and her mom was like, Like he like tied a, he's like, oh, her favorite scarf. And he tied her scarf around her neck in the casket. But really like they exhumed her body later and like his hand marks were on her throat. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And her mom was like, oh, her, my daughter's spirit is visiting me at night. And she told me exactly what happened. And so one of the theories is like either it was paranormal because she had all this information or she just knew what had happened and used that story to kind of get some weight because sadly a courtroom believed the ghost more than they believed a woman (laughs) so awful you know who knows but anyway it reminds me of that story but basically one of the theories is like she she knew alan was responsible somehow but she was too afraid to go tell the police herself i see but at the same time like how did she know the names and numbers of all these people yeah i have no idea i still am kind of wavering on the side of this being supernatural yeah like uh, that's i mean the police believe it even like i ha- i got i got nothing when it comes to like any other trying to debunk it and yeah. for what it's worth remy has vehemently denied that she had any sort of like knowledge of this she continues to insist she was possessed by teresita's ghost and teresita wanted justice and got it um so whether Remy's experience was actually supernatural or not, um, it very obviously led to the capture and conviction of Alan Showery. And uh, Jen Baxter's article on Medium makes a really great point, too, that because of Remy, whether this was a real supernatural event or not, uh, because of Remy, people still remember Teresita's name. Um, and so hey. I'm going to read the last line of the article to end the story because I thought that Jen put it really well. The case got no publicity when Teresita was first murdered. It was the claim of the paranormal that won over the news media. Teresita Bassa will forever be remembered as the woman who solved her own murder. That's and pretty that, badass. I think so. And so whether it was true or not, like at the end, we they got the right guy and, uh, you know, justice was served. So that's the story. Right. How have we never heard of this? I really don't know. And I feel like I've heard that name before. Yeah, I feel like maybe I. I feel like people must have suggested it before, and we just never got to it or something. I don't know because you would think a supernatural solved crime would really be the ring ding dinger for us. (laughs) The ring ding dinger, indeed. Yeah, I feel like if we had heard this, we would have covered it. I mean, I bet if we search our inbox, it'll be like eight thousand people and. Yeah. Everyone right now is like, I've told you to cover this before. but Or someone on TikTok tagged us in a video or something. Probably, probably. But anyway, so that's the that's the story, Morning Glory. Oh, well, what, that's the word, Hummingbird, or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Well, that was a great one. Good job, Christine. Thank you so much. I had a fun I'll- time with you today, Em. I had a fun time with you also. It's always fun to have a story that you end on where I don't feel 
horribly just like there's like at least burdened some for the rest of the day yeah 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 and now eva wants to hop on the zoom to talk to us about the books so oh my goodness so we, should we have, probably go do that we have a whole meeting we gotta go to folks we actually run a business behind the scenes i don't know if you know that well but, uh, eva runs a business we just eva kinda... tells us when to get on zoom and <laughs> she tells us about business so uh <laughs> there's that and that's why we drink yay